Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is balanced Y-configured loads. Our objective is to examine balanced Y-configured loads in three-phase AC circuit analysis scenarios. The lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with three-phase AC, as illustrated in the introduction of three-phase AC lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. Three-phase AC circuit analysis is often preceded by the foreboding statement, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. This needn't be the case, especially for balanced load configurations, the topic of today's lecture. If you're reasonably competent in performing single-phase AC circuit analysis, this should be a skill well within your reach. This being said, you need to have a level of organization and visualization skills to survive a meeting engagement with three-phase AC circuits with some level of dignity intact. Let's discuss some general tactics for three-phase AC circuit analysis before we begin our discussion of balanced Y-configured loads. Prior to beginning any three-phase AC circuit analysis, balanced or unbalanced, Y or delta configuration, I typically ask myself a series of simple questions starting with, what voltage does a load in this particular system see? Does a load see the line-to-neutral differential or the line-to-line -line differential? After satisfying this first question, I then ask myself the simple follow-up. What current does a load in this particular system experience? Does a load directly experience full line current or does it experience only a portion of line current? The answers to these two simple questions are of tremendous benefit to any three-phase AC circuit analysis scenario. Once these initial questions are answered, the act of analysis is merely application of single-phase AC circuit analysis principles, like Ohm's Law and the power equations, techniques you've had ample exposure with by now. Even the dreaded unbalanced 3 wire y configuration, a monster of fearsome repute, can be rendered into a tame and docile beast that sits, stays, and rolls over on command with a little advanced planning and forethought. As I hope to demonstrate, three-phase AC circuit analysis isn't nearly as hard as you might expect, and even those scenarios that, as a whole, may refuse to bend to your will, can easily be broken into three easily manageable portions using the superposition theorem. If you recall in the aforementioned lecture, we examined Y and delta configuration of three-phase AC sources and compared and contrasted line-to-neutral voltages and line-to-line -line voltages. Consider a four-wire Y configuration composed of three sinusoidal AC voltage sources, each with an effective value of 120 volts offset from each other by a relative 120 degrees. Between L1 and conjoined neutral terminal N, there is a differential of 120 volts at an angle of zero degrees. Similarly, between L2 and N, there is a differential of 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees. And finally, between L3 and N, there is a differential of 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. The line-to-line -line differentials necessitate some minor calculations. Using phasors, L1 to L2 is 208 volts at an angle of 30 degrees. L2 to L3 is 208 volts at an angle of negative 90 degrees. And L3 to L1 is 208 volts at an angle of 150 degrees. If we didn't want to use phasors and wanted to use a shortcut, we could say each line-to-line -line differential is square root 3, or roughly 1.73 times larger, and offset by 30 degrees. Either method, phasor math, or the shortcut yields the same result. We can also center these resultant phasors on the origin of our original phasor diagram. Again, note both the line-to-neutral and line-to-line -line differentials each exhibit a relative phase shift of 120 degrees from each other. 120 degrees separates L1 from L2, L2 from L3, and L3 from L1. Similarly, 120 degrees separates L1, L2 from L2, L3, L2, L3 from L3, L1, and L3, L1 from L1, L2. This phasor diagram assumes L1 is our reference at zero degrees. If we wanted to, we could also reference this whole system with respect to the line-to-line -line differentials. 
assuming we choose L1, L2 as our reference, L1, L2 is 208 volts at an angle of zero degrees. L2, L3 is 208 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees, and L3, L1 is 208 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. Given L1, L2 is now assumed to be our new reference, L1 is 120 volts at an angle of negative 30 degrees. L2 is 120 volts at an angle of negative 150 degrees, and L3 is 120 volts at an angle of 90 degrees. Either phasor diagram is correct as long as the user is aware of which reference is being employed, either one of the line to neutral voltages or one of the line to line voltages. You need to be aware that the phasor diagram on the right is identical to the one on the left only it's been shifted 30 degrees clockwise, or negative 30 degrees to account for L1, L2 being employed as the reference. Similarly, the phasor diagram on the left is identical to the one on the right, only it's been shifted 30 degrees counterclockwise, or positive 30 degrees to account for L1 being employed as the reference. More to the point, you should realize that this is a dual voltage three phase AC system. Load elements using the line to neutral connection would experience the smaller 120 volt line to neutral differential, whereas load elements using the line to line connections would experience the larger 208 volt line to line differential. This is pretty cool and the focus of our introductory exploration today. Let's simplify the three phase AC source as solely the L1, L2, L3 and neutral lines. Using this simplification, we're not aware of internal details, however, we are aware of both line to neutral and line to line differentials. If we didn't use the neutral connection, or somehow restricted access to it, we'd still be aware of the line to line differentials. Let's now take a look at how various load configurations interact with these different voltage levels. If you recall, a Y configuration is an arrangement of three load impedances where each branch impedance radiates from a central node forming the shape of a Y. Y configured loads can interact with three phase AC sources in one of two related manners. A four wire Y configuration directly connects the pooled central connection of the load to the end connection of the three phase AC source. Whereas a three wire Y configuration does not. The general diagram for both these Y configurations shows impedance element Z1 is directly connected to node A, impedance element Z2 is connected to node B, and impedance element Z3 is connected to node C. A delta configuration, in contrast, is a continuous looped arrangement of three load impedances forming the shape of a triangle. Similar to the three-wire Y configuration, a delta configuration does not make use of the N connection. In this general use diagram, impedance element ZAB goes from node A to node B. Impedance element ZBC goes from node B to node C, and impedance element ZCA goes from node C to node A. I will admit delta connections are a little confusing, and to lessen the confusion, I encourage you to just pick a direction and go with it. In this case, I go from A to B, B to C, and C back to A. These diagrams make two very important facts quite clear. A four wire Y configuration makes use of the smaller line to neutral voltage from a node of interest to the end connection. Whereas the delta configuration makes use of the larger line to line voltage from node to node. We'll examine the particulars of three wire Y configurations in a moment. Allow me a moment to expound upon these important observations for those that aren't immediately seeing this. Let's take a look at the four wire Y configuration first. For convenience sake, let's assume L1 is our reference. As such, L1 has a phase shift of zero degrees, L2 has a phase shift of negative 120 degrees, and L3 has a phase shift of 120 degrees. Using L1 as our reference, the line to line differentials are offset by a relative 30 degrees. L1, L2 has a phase shift of 30 degrees, L2, L3 has a phase shift of negative 90 degrees, and L3, L1 has a phase shift of 150 degrees. The differential L1 applied at node A and conjoined terminal N establishes a differential of 120 volts at an angle of zero degrees. 
load impedance Z1 goes from node A to node N. It makes sense that the voltage across the load impedance Z1 is 120 volts at an angle of zero degrees. Similarly, L2 between node B and conjoined neutral terminal N establishes a differential of 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees. Load impedance Z2 goes from node B to node N. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance Z2 is therefore 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees. Finally, L3 establishes a differential of 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees between node C and node N. Load impedance Z3 goes from node C to node N. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance Z3 is therefore 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. In summary, load impedance in a 4-wire Y configuration experience the line to neutral differential. Let's now take a look at the three wire delta configuration. For convenience sake, let's assume L1, L2 is our reference. As such, L1, L2 has a phase shift of zero degrees. L2, L3 has a phase shift of negative 120 degrees, and L3, L1 has a phase shift of 120 degrees. Using this particular reference, offsets the line to neutral differentials by a relative 30 degrees. L1 has a phase shift of negative 30 degrees, L2 has a phase shift of negative 150 degrees, and L3 has a phase shift of 90 degrees. Between lines L1 and L2, connected to nodes A and B, there is a differential of 208 volts at an angle of zero degrees. Load impedance ZAB goes from node A to node B. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance ZAB is 208 volts at an angle of zero degrees. Similarly, between lines L2 and L3 connected to nodes B and C, there is a differential of 208 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees. Load impedance BC goes from node B to node C. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance ZBC is 208 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees. Finally, between lines L3 and L1 connected to nodes C and A, there is a differential of 208 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. Load impedance ZCA goes from node C to node A. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance ZCA is 208 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. In summary, loads in a delta configuration experience the line-to-line -line differential. Again, load impedances in a four-wire Y configuration experience the smaller line-to-neutral differential, whereas load impedances in a three-wire delta configuration experience the larger line-to-line -line differential. You need to pause the lecture and dig this on every level that I do before you move on because it's about to get real confusing real quick. Let's talk about current. Whereas voltage is pretty easy to describe using a point-to-point -point differential, current flow through three-phase AC circuits takes a little bit more foresight and planning. Consider current flow in a four-wire Y configuration. Current in line L1 must travel through load impedance Z1. Current in line L2 must travel through load impedance Z2. Finally, current in line L3 must travel through load impedance Z3. It can be said that line current equals load current for a four-wire Y configuration. The fourth wire in a four-wire Y configuration serves as a return path for any imbalanced current between the different phases. Kirchhoff's current law applied to the central node implies that current in the N line equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. More on this in a moment. The important takeaway being that line current equals load current for a four-wire Y configuration. Three ammeters placed in series on the three lines could easily measure both current in that particular line and current in that particular branch impedance because they are one and the same. Again, line current equals load current for Y configured impedances. If only current flow through delta configurations could be so easy. So we don't lose ourselves in the forest Let's leave a trail of breadcrumbs so we can find our way back by incorporating some ammeters in the following fashion. Ammeter 1 
measures line one current from the source to node A. Assume direction of travel is left to right. Ammeter two measures line two current from the source to node B. Assume direction of travel is left to right. Finally, ammeter three measures line three current from the source to node C. Assume direction of travel is left to right. Three additional ammeters are then used to measure current through the load impedances. Again, just pick a direction and go with it. A to B, B to C, C back to A. Ammeter AB measures current through impedance element ZAB. Assume direction of travel is A to B. Ammeter BC measures current through impedance element ZBC. Assume direction of travel is B to C. Finally, ammeter CA measures current through impedance element ZCA. Assume direction of travel is C to A. Given these assumed directions of travel for line and load currents, let's apply Kirchhoff's current law to each of the nodes forming the delta configuration. Consider node A. Both I1 and ICA are incoming current paths, whereas IAB is an outgoing current path. An application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that I1 equals IAB minus ICA. Similarly, consider node B. Both I2 and IAB are incoming current paths, whereas IBC is an outgoing current path. An application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that I2 equals IBC minus IAB. Finally, consider node C. Both I3 and IBC are incoming current paths, where ICA is an outgoing current path. An application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that I3 equals ICA minus IBC. Consider this larger picture. Current IAB travels through the ammeter on line one left to right, through load impedance ZAB from A to B, and through the ammeter on line two right to left. Similarly, current IBC travels through the ammeter on line two left to right, through load impedance ZBC from B to C, and through the ammeter on line three right to left. Finally, current ICA travels through the ammeter on line three left to right, through load impedance ZCA from C to A, and through the ammeter on line one right to left. You may wish to rewind that last part. The important takeaway being that unlike our observations of Y configurations, line current does not equal load current for three wire delta configurations. Line current is in effect the combination of two currents exhibiting a relative phase shift between each other coming and going. Given our previous experience with the line-to-line -line differentials, is it any wonder that line current for delta configurations will be larger than load current and exhibit a phase-shifted offset? It shouldn't be. Despite the subtractive nature of the Kirchhoff's current law equation for each node, accounting for phase shift, line current is always greater than load current for delta configurations. We'll examine the specifics of delta configured loads in later lectures. For now, I just need you to burn these general facts into your long-term memory because believe me, you'll be seeing them again and again and again. With respect to voltage distribution, load impedances in four wire Y configurations experience the smaller line to neutral voltage differential, whereas load impedances in a three wire delta configuration experience the larger line to line differential. With respect to current flow, current in a particular line is equal to the current through a particular load for a four wire Y configuration, whereas line current for a delta configured load is greater than load current. Like I said, we'll examine delta configurations in greater detail in the very near future. For now, let's put these observations aside and deal with only balanced Y configured loads. It goes without stating that Y configurations look like Ys. This being said, Ys take up a lot of space and it's sometimes easier to draw them as such. You'll note this diagram is functionally equivalent to a Y configuration. Load impedance Z1 between node A and N has a magnitude of 365 ohms at an angle of 28 degrees. Similarly, load impedance Z2 between node B and node N also has a magnitude of 365 ohms 
at an angle of 28 degrees. Finally, load impedance Z3 between node C and node N also has a magnitude of 365 ohms at an angle of 28 degrees. This is the definition of a balanced load. All impedances constituting the Y configuration have not only the same magnitude, but also the same angle. Z1 equals Z2 equals Z3. Source L1 establishes a differential of 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees between node A and node N. Load impedance Z1 goes from node A to node N. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance Z1 is 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. Similarly, source L2 establishes a differential of 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees between node B and node N. Load impedance Z2 goes from node B to node N. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance Z2 is therefore 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees. Finally, source L3 establishes a differential of 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees between node C and node N. Load impedance Z3 goes from node C to node N. It makes sense that the voltage across load impedance Z3 is therefore 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. Current in line 1 travels through load impedance Z1 and returns via the neutral connection. Similarly, current in line 2 travels through load impedance Z2 and returns via the neutral connection. Finally, current in line 3 travels through load impedance Z3 and returns via the neutral connection. It can be said that line current equals load current. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of IN suggests that IN equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. In summary, each impedance element in this balanced four-wire Y configuration experiences a smaller line to neutral voltage, and each load impedance experiences the line current. These are the most fundamental aspects of four-wire Y configurations. Before we dive into the specifics of this analysis, allow me to make this bold prediction about this balanced circuit. Given each branch impedance is identical, and each branch impedance experiences the same voltage magnitude, my understanding of Ohm's law tells me that each branch impedance will experience the same current magnitude, relative phase shift, apparent, real, and reactive power. Let's see how well these predictions hold up to analysis. An application of Ohm's law for load impedance Z1 demonstrates current through it will be 328.8 milliampers at an angle of negative 28 degrees. A phasor diagram illustrates current lags voltage by a relative 28 degrees. Application of the AC power formula demonstrates load impedance Z1 experiences 39.5 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 34.8 watts is directed towards real power and 18.5 vars is directed towards a reactive interchange. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law for load impedance Z2 demonstrates current through it will be 328.8 milliampers at an angle of negative 148 degrees. A phasor diagram illustrates current lags voltage by a relative 28 degrees. The current magnitude through load impedance Z2 has the same magnitude and relative phase shift as current through load impedance Z1. This is to be expected for a balanced configuration. Using only this relative phase shift, application of the AC power formula demonstrates load impedance Z2 also experiences 39.5 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 34.8 watts is directed towards real power and 18.5 vars is directed towards a reactive interchange. Load impedance Z2 experiences the same amount of apparent, real, and reactive power as load impedance Z1. This is again to be expected for a balanced configuration. If you haven't figured it out yet, balanced configurations allow us to save time because each branch is identical. I hereby predict no calculations required that current through load impedance Z3 will also have a magnitude of 328.8 milliampers and lag voltage across it by a relative 28 degrees. This implies I3 is 328.8 milliampers at an angle of 92 degrees. I also predict load impedance Z3 will also experience 39.5 volt amperes of apparent power of which 34.8 watts is directed towards real power and 18.5 vars is directed towards reactive interchange. Calculations support these predictions. An application of Ohm's law for load impedance Z3 demonstrates current through it will be 328.8 milliampers at an angle of 92 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current lags voltage by a relative 28 degrees. 
An application of the AC power formula using only relative phase shift demonstrates load impedance Z3 experiences 39.5 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 34.8 watts is direct towards real power and 18.5 bars is direct towards a reactive interchange. Let's now examine total apparent, total real, and total reactive power for this complete circuit. There's a couple means of doing so. First, apparent power in equals apparent power out, accounting for angles. Substituting our given values yields a total apparent power figure of 118.4 volt amperes. We can then resolve this into its total real and total reactive components. Additionally, one can solve for total real and total reactive power individually using a similar technique. Total real power equals the summation of individual real powers. Similarly, total reactive power for this system equals the summation of individual reactive powers. Substituting in our given values yields a total real power figure of 104.5 watts and a total reactive power figure of 55.6 vars. If you wanted to save time, if you had the apparent, real, and reactive power figure for a single element in a balanced configuration, you could just multiply these figures by three times to get the total apparent total real, or total reactive power. In summary, balanced three-phase AC circuit analysis is not three-phase AC circuit analysis. It's not even three repetitions of single-phase AC circuit analysis. It's simply one application of single-phase AC circuit analysis, and then you just appropriately phase shift each result by 120 degrees. Like I said, Three-phase AC has an unwarranted reputation as being some arcane, esoteric black magic to be wielded by only a chosen few. Balanced load configurations aren't that hard. Yes, your lazy lab partner still struggles with engineering notation after 30 weeks of repeat exposure, but I bet I could teach a golden retriever to do balanced three-phase AC circuit analysis in less than an hour. Maybe not, but I bet a golden retriever would make a much better lab partner. At least you could trust the dog to fetch something from the supply room without wandering off and getting run over by a train. Moving on, let's now examine current in the end line for a balanced four-wire Y configuration. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of IN suggests that IN equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. Substituting at our given values yields IN to be zero amps at an angle of zero degrees. What just happened here? Is my calculator broke? Do three equal currents exhibiting a relative 120 degree phase shift between each other really just run headlong into each other and vanish into a puff of nothing? Absolutely not. However, the phasor representation initially makes this vanishing act seem plausible. You'll recall phasor equivalents are simply shorthand representations for time-variant sinusoidal equivalents. This is where it's helpful to remind ourselves of what a phasor really represents. Plotted as a function of time, sinusoidal voltage across and current through impedance element Z1 would look something like this. Assuming voltage L1 is our reference, current through Z1 lags voltage across it by a relative 28 degrees. Similarly, when sinusoidal voltage across and current through impedance element Z2 is plotted as a function of time, it would look something like this. Assuming L1 is our reference, L2 lags L1 by 120 degrees, and current lags our assumed reference by 148 degrees. This being said, current through Z2 still lags voltage across it by a relative 28 degrees. Finally, when sinusoidal voltage across and current through impedance element Z3 is plotted as a function of time, it would look something like this. Assuming L1 is our reference, L3 lags L1 by 240 degrees, or more appropriately, leads it by 120 degrees, and current leads our assumed reference by 92 degrees. This being said, current through Z3 still lags voltage across it by a relative 28 degrees. Here's when things get interesting. When we superimpose the plots of just current as a function of time on top of each other, we notice something quite interesting. Each sinusoidal current obviously has the same magnitude and exhibits a relative 120 degree phase shift between each other. However, at any moment in time, the instantaneous value of I1 
plus i2 plus i3 does in fact equal zero. Consider a time when i1 equals its positive peak value of 328.8 milliamp years times square root two or roughly 465 milliamp years. At that exact same moment in time, i2 happens to be negative 232.5 milliamp years as does i3. Recall we initially assume positive direction of travel to be left to right. Polarity implies that positive 465 milliamp years of current travels through load impedance Z1 left to right and enters the central node, where it splits into two equal paths. 232.5 milliamp years goes right to left through load impedance Z2, and the remaining 232.5 milliamp years goes right to left through load impedance Z3. Other moments in time yield the same results. At any particular instant in time, the summation of instantaneous current values do in fact equal zero. Again, a phasor equivalent is only a shorthand representation of time variant sinusoidal phenomenon that simply makes the process of calculation and algebraic manipulation that much easier. More to the point, given both the phasor and instantaneous summation of I1, I2, and I3 yield zero, this implies that current in the fourth end line is zero. This begs the question, why have an end connection at all? If we cut the end line or simply prohibit access to the end connection, absolutely nothing changes. The removal of the fourth end wire yields a balanced three wire Y configuration in every respect, a direct copy of the four wire Y configuration. The only difference being that money is being saved on eliminating the fourth wire. In summary, if a four wire Y configuration is truly balanced, where the term balanced implies that each branch impedance is the same magnitude and angle, the same voltage and current magnitude and relative phase shift and the same apparent real and reactive power and no current exists in the end line, the fourth wire can effectively be eliminated without unduly affecting any of these properties and just call it a three wire Y configuration and save money and wire. The opposite also holds true. If a three wire circuit is truly balanced such that each branch impedance has the same magnitude and angle, we can effectively treat it as if it were a balanced four wire Y configuration for the purposes of analysis. Which begs another question. Balanced four wire Y configurations and balanced three wire Y configurations are functionally equivalent with one another. Why do four wire Y configurations exist if three wire Y configurations exhibit the same properties yet use less wire? Why not use three wire Y configurations all the time? The answer to this question is found in the simple qualifier balanced. Only when a Y configuration is truly balanced such that each branch impedance has the same magnitude and angle do any of these assumptions hold true. Unbalanced load configurations? Not so much. We'll learn in later lectures that unbalanced 4-wire Y configurations and unbalanced 3-wire Y configurations exhibit astoundingly different properties and these same simplifications cannot be made. Load elements in unbalanced four wire Y configurations still experience the same line to neutral voltage magnitude. However, current magnitude, relative phase shift, and apparent real and reactive power understandably differ as a function of branch impedance. In an unbalanced four wire Y configuration, the fourth wire effectively serves to carry the amount of imbalanced current away from the unbalanced load. I like to think of the fourth wire in an unbalanced four wire Y configuration as a relief path, such that voltage magnitude across each impedance in the Y configuration remains the same. Load elements in unbalanced three wire Y configurations, in contrast, might not even experience the same voltage magnitude, to say nothing of current magnitude, relative phase shift, and apparent real and reactive power. In the case of an unbalanced three wire Y configuration, all bets are off and everything goes because any imbalanced current is left to circulate throughout the system, making a mockery of our previous assumptions. Again, we'll examine unbalanced four and three wire Y configurations in later lectures. For now, we're dealing solely with balanced configurations and operating inside these very strict limits, our task is relatively easy and straightforward. I summarize three phase AC circuit analysis for balanced Y configurations as follows. Each load impedance 
and a balanced four-wire Y configuration is identical in not only magnitude, but also angle. Each load impedance experiences the line-to-neutral voltage magnitude. Line current is equal to load current. Load current magnitude and relative phase shift is the same. Each load impedance will experience the same apparent, real, and reactive power. And finally, total apparent, total real, and total reactive power consumed by the complete circuit will be the summation of each branch impedance apparent, real, and reactive power. Finally, finally, for a four-wire Y configuration, current in the fourth neutral wire is the summation of I1 plus I2 plus I3. In the balanced condition, no current travels through the neutral line, and if we want to, we can effectively eliminate it from consideration. Lacking the fourth wire, carrying no current, one can retroactively apply these same properties to a balanced three-wire Y configuration as if it was a balanced four-wire Y configuration, simply lacking the fourth wire. What do all these ground rules mean with respect to three-phase AC circuit analysis strategy? It means the analysis of balanced Y configured loads is extremely easy. Do a single Ohm's law calculation and appropriately phase shift it for the remaining phases. Then do a single AC power calculation using only the relative phase shift between voltage and current and multiply it by three. Move on to something that will actually give you a challenge. Again, these observations are true only for the balanced four and balanced three wire Y configuration. We'll examine unbalanced four and three wire Y configurations in later lectures. Put your understanding of the above topics to the test with this illustrated example problem. By all means, pause the lecture and solve for voltage, current, apparent, real, and reactive power delivered to each load impedance, as well as the total apparent, real, and reactive power delivered to this complete system. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. It looks like we're dealing with a 240 volt, line to neutral, balanced, four wire Y configuration, where each branch impedance has a value of 400 ohms at an angle of 20 degrees. The voltage across load impedance Z1 is 240 volts at an angle of zero degrees. An application of Ohm's law for load impedance Z1 demonstrates current through it will be 600 milliamperes at an angle of negative 20 degrees. Current lags voltage by a relative 20 degrees. Application of the AC power formula demonstrates load impedance Z1 experiences 144 volt amperes of apparent power of which 135.3 watts is directed towards real power and 49.3 VARs is directed towards a reactive interchange. Stop right here. Put your calculator away. It's a balanced four wire Y configuration. Don't repeat these same calculations. Just write down the same answers and appropriately phase shift the response. Voltage across load impedance Z2 is also 240 volts only it's shifted by negative 120 degrees. Current through it will also be 600 milliamperes and will also exhibit a relative negative 20 degree phase shift. Expressed as a phasor equivalent, I2 is therefore 600 milliamperes at an angle of negative 140 degrees. Load impedance Z2 also experiences 144 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 135.3 watts is directed towards real power, and 49.3 VARs is directed towards a reactive interchange. The same holds true for load impedance Z3. Voltage across load impedance Z3 is also 240 volts, only it's shifted by 120 degrees. Current through it will also be 600 milliamperes and will also exhibit a relative negative 20 degree phase shift. Expressed as a phasor equivalent, I3 is therefore 600 milliamperes at an angle of 100 degrees. Load impedance Z3 also experiences the same amount of apparent, real, and reactive power. Total apparent power is the summation of individual apparent powers. Or, if you're interested in saving time, total apparent power is the apparent power for one of the balanced loads multiplied by 3. Substituting at our given values is 432 volt amperes. This can be resolved into its total real and total reactive power components or individual real and individual reactive power dimensions can also be summated, or a single individual real or reactive power component can be multiplied by three. Either method yields a total real power figure of 405.9 watts 
and a total reactive power figure of 147.8 bars. An application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that current in the neutral line is I1 plus I2 plus I3. Substituting in our given values yields 0 amps. Since it's not carrying current anyways, let's just get rid of the fourth wire and call this a balanced 3-wire Y configuration. As long as this load remains balanced, where again balance implies Z1 equals Z2 equals Z3, we can assume this 3-wire Y configuration will exhibit identical behavior to the previous 4-wire Y configuration. That is that. In conclusion, this lecture examined the analysis of balanced 4 and balanced 3-wire Y configurations in 3-phase AC systems. We learned voltage and current magnitude, relative phase shift, apparent, real, and reactive power are identical for each branch impedance comprising the balanced Y configured load. Addition, we learned a balanced configuration carries no current in the fourth neutral wire. Finally, we learned a balanced 3-wire Y configuration can be effectively treated as a balanced 4-wire Y configuration simply lacking the fourth wire. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.